Okay, John, the meeting can begin. Thanks. Okay. If everybody's ready, uh, good morning and uh, welcome to the March 19th, 2021 Save Our Indian River Lagoon Project Plan Citizens Oversight Committee meeting. I want to call the meeting to order. Carol, would you call the roll, please? Uh, yes, Lorraine Koss. Um, Charles Venuto. Present. Vinny Taranto. John Windsor. Here. Terry Here. Casto. Here. David Lane. Here. Laura Lee Thompson. Here. Stephanie Ely. Kimberly Newton. Here, thank you. Courtney Barker. Todd Here. Swingle. Here. Su Susan Hodgers. Here. Dennis Basil. Here. Okay. Um, Carol, did you get me? I did. It's Lorraine, yeah. I did. Thank you. I believe we have a form. Thank you, Carol. You're welcome. Uh, could I get somebody in the room to make a motion about acceptance of virtual votes? Um, John, this is Walker. Sorry to interrupt. Um, we are still waiting on, is it, is it Stephanie? Yeah. Oh, we do okay. Not have a quorum here. We're, we're one member short. So. Okay. Sorry it. about that. Okay. She did uh, confirm that she would be attending. Okay. Should we uh, move down the agenda to something that uh, we don't need to vote on? Uh, how about if we move down to, let's see, approval of the agenda requires a, a, a motion. Um, Anthony, how about you read the public uh, 
the public uh, participation portion of this. All right. <laughs> so for your information, I want to share the following logistical information. Um, please note this meeting is being recorded. So for in-person attendees, please see Crystal at the back of the room for a comment card. All online attendees um, will be muted and unmuted um, to be heard. Attendees will remain muted until specific moments on the agenda when public comment is accepted. Members of the public who wish to give public comment will be unmuted to speak one at a time before each business item is voted on by the members of the Citizen Oversight Committee. And again, at the end of the meeting during the general public comment period. To indicate that you want to speak on a specific agenda item, use a Zoom raise hand tool when the meeting gets to that agenda item. For those participating via computer, attendees will see a raise hand tool at the bottom of their screen and participants will need to select the participants icon at the bottom of the screen. The raise hand tool is an icon at the bottom of the participant's window. For those participating via phone, dial star nine. The meeting host will see a list of everyone who wants to speak and will unmute and call on those individuals one at a time. Please state your name and residence. You will have three minutes to speak. The timer will sound at the end of your allotted time and the next speaker will be called on and unmuted for their three minute window. The process of raising hands and accepting public comment will be repeated before each business item is voted on. And again, at the end of the meeting during the general public comment period. Instructions for hand raising will be repeated when it's time to hear public comment. Committee members will also be using the raise hand feature and will be called on to speak one at a time by the chair. The chair will check to see if committee members have clarifying questions for a speaker before calling up the next speaker. General comments from the committee or discussion of issues raised by speakers will be held to the end of the meeting to be addressed under final comment from the chair and committee. Back to you, John. Thanks, Anthony. Um, we can go on with, then with item five, which is introduction of new committee members. And uh, we have a newly uh, appointed committee member, Susan Hammerling Hodgers, and she was uh, approved by the Board of County Commissioners. Uh, Susan, would you like to say hello to the group? Thank you, John. Good morning, everybody. I'm glad to be here. Hi, Courtney, Vinny, Stephanie. Hi, I'm Susan. And uh, I'm excited to be part of the organization. And thank you for Virginia for helping with everything. Susan, are you able to share your camera with us? So uh, I'm not sure everybody knows you. Uh, so if we see you in public someplace, we, we know we're not supposed to talk to you about issues that are coming before, <laughs> coming before the, uh, the Citizens Oversight Committee. Oh, okay, gotcha, thank you. All right, and in addition, didn't we have somebody else uh, approved by the Board of County Commissioners, Virginia? No, we're, um, the League of Cities asked us to re-advertise so I was going to say this later, but um, the, the vacant position is currently re-advertised for two and a half weeks. It, the applications are due April 6th. We'll take those applications and um, provide them back to the League of Cities. They're meeting on April 12th. Um, okay. And once we get their results, then we will schedule that before the county commission, which will probably be the first meeting in May. Okay. Thank you. Um, we do now have a, a physical quorum. Oh, good, good. Okay, so then let's go back up to the uh, top of the agenda where we have, um, let's see, acceptance of virtual votes. We need a motion to accept for the acceptance of virtual votes from somebody in the room. So moved. So moved. And I'll second. second. <laughs> Okay, and all in favor? Aye. 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 I, yeah, Aye. I'm not, vote, I'm not voting, I'm not in the room, so. Aye. Okay, so, so and, and all opposed? Nobody, so it passes unanimously in the room. So now everybody who's on virtual, who's able to vote, uh, who, uh, are able to proceed forward with voting. Um, okay, new committee members. Uh, next item is the approval of the agenda. Can I have a motion to approve the agenda? Motion to approve. This Second. 
A second. second. Charlie. Second from Charlie. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Okay. Passes unanimously. Okay. Down now to selection of chair and vice chair. Okay. So I assume that what we do here uh, is open this up for uh, nominations for chair. Do I have a nomination for chair? Um, I have a nomination, if you would, if the board would be pleased to hear it. I think Courtney. I, I think that, thank you, Chair. I think that um, Vinny Toronto has been an amazing member, and I think he would be an amazing chair. He puts an enormous amount of time into this committee, and he's been here from the start, so I think he would be a great chair. Okay. Uh, are there any other nominations for chair? Uh, seeing none, should I close the nominations for chair and ask the committee, are, are you, Vinny, are you willing to do this, first of all? Uh, I, I like being voluntold, so yeah, I'm, I'm oh, all about oh, this. Okay. It, so it would be an honor. Vinny's willing to do this and um, no other uh, nominations. I Do we need uh, some, some approval from the committee or is this just by acclamation? What do we do here? You you had a you had a second from Susan Hodgers. I don't know if you heard that. And okay. then yes, you need a committee vote. And so all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. It's unanimous, Vinny. You're Yay. now the chair you're now the chair. And so <laughs> it's it's with great pleasure that I hand the gavel over to you <laughs> to continue this process and selecting a vice chair. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, Courtney, uh, and everybody else. Uh, like I said, it is an honor. Uh, this is a good group, a uh, good group of people that care about our, our lagoon and our community. And uh, John, uh, thank you um, for your uh, work as chairman. Boy, going through a pandemic, huh? That's <laughs> something you probably never thought you'd, you'd do while you were chairing. So, um, Thank you very much for your flexibility. I've seen it, pretzels. You can fold yourself into a pretzel, it's impressive. So, um, okay, I guess the next, the next uh, uh, line of duty would be for a vice chair. So I'll open the floor up. Is there any, any nominations for a vice chair? Can I nominate Charlie Venuto? Uh, I don't, I'm an alternate. He's an alternate, so that means... <laughs> He is an alternate, and I, I don't believe. Okay. We have the members available would be um, Stephanie Ely, Susan Hodgers, David Lane. David Lane. David on the line. Yes. Um, John Windsor. John Windsor. Can I nominate John Windsor as the vice chair? Would he be willing to do that? <laughs> of course not. <laughs> Who said that? Him. Lorraine. Lorraine said that. Thank you, Lorraine. Uh, I would prefer not if we can find somebody else who'd be willing to volunteer. Um, this, as Vinny pointed out, lots of lots of twists over this last year, and uh, I'm not sure I can handle another year of this uh, either as chair or vice chair. Um, I, you know, so if, if you can find somebody else, I would prefer that. I I'd like to nominate I Stephanie Ely. I'll second that. Okay, we have a nomination for Stephanie Ely. Is there any other nominations for vice chair? Okay, so it looks like uh, we'll go ahead and close the nominations. And uh, uh, there was a second on that nomination. So let's do a vote. All those in favor of Stephanie Ely being vice chair, say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, looks 
like it passes. Thank you, Stephanie. All right. So, Thank you, Vinny. Oh, my pleasure. All right. So let's go down the uh, do the uh, approval of the agenda. So, oh, oh. sorry, sorry. Approval in a minute. Okay, uh, I think we're good now. I think we, we control the feedback. All right, so um, the approval of the minutes. Is there a motion to approve the minutes? So moved. Okay. I will second Jeremy, that. Did you get that? I, I didn't get who made the motion. I'm sorry. Windsor. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, and did you get the second too, Carol? Was that David Lane? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Aye. Okay. All right, so let's go into the progress and fiscal reports. Uh, Virginia with the monthly progress report. Thank you. Um, so happy to report that the December revenues are consistent with the projections that are adopted in the 2021 plan. So we're, we're right on track. Um, Palm Bay's North Area Water Reclamation Facility, uh, this, the, the progress report reports a, a time extension executed, but that project is progressing nicely. It's under construction with anticipated completion in September. Um, for the Sykes N septic to sewer project, the demolition for the new lift station is complete. And that's the, the first step in being able to construct the new vacuum station um, for, for that project. Uh, jumping down, um, Brevard Zoo constructed a 1,750 square foot oyster bar in the central lagoon um, near the Wexford condo. Um, and uh, this is the first time we've reported UCF um, monthly monitoring actually found a decline in oyster density and growth at one of our sites, the Bettinger Oyster Bar. Um, this is one of two sites that are within a canal system. And so those two canal sites are, uh, the populations are declining. Uh, all of our open water sites, the populations are increasing. So. Uh, we are focusing our attention on open water sites and we are trying to learn more about uh, what the limitations are in those canal sites to figure out whether we need to rule out all canal sites or whether there's you know, specific factors for those uh, two that we need to better understand and avoid. Um, for derelict vessels, we removed two more over the last month. For the leaky laterals in our pilot project, um, six three of those have now been completed and utilities is going to re smoke test that area so that we have fresh data. We're going to start the county is going to start over with issuing notices to all the folks who own uh, homes where leaks are found, um, providing them a notice of uh, enforcement. They will be given a certain amount of time to make those repairs before fines start to accrue. Uh, we will also notify them of the grants available through the half cent sales tax to uh, assist them with those repairs. And so um, we're, we're hoping to see all of those problems resolved um, over the next year. Cone Road septic to sewer, uh, 55 properties have connected. There are only four remaining. And actually I've seen a few emails in the last week. So I'm guessing that number is even smaller now. Um, in septic upgrades, we have now approved 160 applications. Uh, those continue to come in, so um, that we're seeing increased um, participation in that program. 
Grand Canal muck dredging that's going to resume here very soon, next week? Yeah, they should start, start dredging next week. Thank you, Walker. Um, and you're going to hear uh, a presentation today from Becky Clarkson. She's been working on a tourism-funded grant about communication transparency. Uh, we've collected a lot of great information that you will learn about today. Um, and Crystal has been uh, very, very busy with budget change requests that are part of the annual county process for examining what we bought was going to be our balance at the end of the previous fiscal year versus what our actual balance was. So um, adjusting those balance forward and then uh, recognizing that our uh, revenues for this year are probably higher than what we projected at this time last year when we were in the middle of the governor's short shutdown order. We had no idea uh, how much our, our revenues would be impacted. Um, and, and then doing adjustments for putting all of the new projects from the 2021 plan update into the budget. So all of that is uh, underway right now. And as soon as that is done, then she'll begin preparing the, the fiscal year 21-22 budget. In terms of presentations, um, you know, COVID is, a, is an odd time for, for presentations, but uh, people are, are learning this virtual reality. And so uh, I was invited along with Dwayne DeFries to, um, to present and, and speak with the Leadership Brevard class. Um, so that was a great opportunity. Um, Citizens Academy is a, is a county program. Uh, there are 50 or 60 people in this year's virtual class. So that was a great opportunity. Um, and then the uh, Save Our Indian River Lagoon plan is supposed to be a part of the April 15th county budget workshop. I wanted to highlight a few forum and events coming up. Um, next week, and uh, I think we'll talk about this some more, but the Indian River Coalition is going to have another one of their great uh, Lagoon Straight Talk events. This one's going to be focused on Palm Bay. And the same day, March 24th, uh, Florida Tech is going to have a lunch and learn on restoration of the Indian River Lagoon. And the end of March, beginning of April, there's actually a three-day program um, put on by the Sarasota Bay Estuary Program on Florida microalgae. Uh, workshops look quite interesting for anybody that wants more information on algae blooms. Um, in terms of upcoming volunteer participation opportunities, the City of Satellite Beach is hosting their Samson Island restoration. Courtney, did you want to add anything? Um, just that you can go to our website and fill out the volunteer form if you are interested in volunteering. We're still recruiting volunteers for that project. so. Um, we need as much help as we can get. So if you are interested in doing that, we provide all the boat transportation out there. Um, so just, you know, contact us and we'll be glad to put you on the team. Okay. Thank you. Um, Blue Marlin Real Estate is hosting a cleanup of Bird Island and Keep Brevard Beautiful is having their annual trash bash. So lots of opportunities to get out in the lagoon and help with restoration and cleanup. And that's my report, Chair. All right. Uh, thank you very much, Virginia. Lots of good stuff. I did want to add another one, too, just one other event coming up on April 15th from the uh, City of Melbourne and MRC. It's an Explorer's Guide to Stormwater. It's a virtual field trip, so you can do it from home. But I just think um, stormwater uh, is such an important thing that people don't think about, the water that runs down and how it collects um, nutrients into the lagoon. So if you go to the MRC website, uh, you'll be able to see them uh, information about the Explorer's Guide to Stormwater from your couch in your PJs. Mm -hmm. So um, it sounds like fun. Um, thank you, everybody, for that. And now we'll move on to could, the monthly. Could, uh, Chair, could Please. I ask a question for Virginia? Uh, Virginia, I think you mentioned in the um, email to us that the uh, update to the plan was approved since we last met. Yes. And I was curious as to uh, what feedback you got from the commissioners on the plan, any areas that they had, uh, I don't know, they're highlighting, emphasizing, or uh, disagreements, I guess. Um, 
the, the comment that, that sticks in my mind is that uh, in previous years, the committee, the, the board had asked the committee to reconsider and, and do some shifting and the committee had uh, taken that direction and, and looked at that harder and brought back something that the, the county commission uh, had adopted and uh, 2021 changes were in line with that previous direction. So um, they were they were generally happy with what the committee had recommended and approved it with very little discussion. All right, uh, anyone else have any other questions for the uh, monthly progress report? If not, we will move on to the monthly revenue graph from Crystal. All right, thank you. Go ahead, Crystal. Can you all hear me good? All right. Hello, everyone. So I would like to report this is the first time ever that we have actually received revenue that went higher than EDR which is the state's projection. However, the state's projection is lower than it has ever been due to the um, COVID-19. Um, at today, we are at 185.6 million that we have received. This particular month, we had our quarterly true up. So with that in our usual, we came to just short of 6 million at this juncture. Below is Sorry to scroll on you so that you can actually see that the numbers um, and the difference between each one and where we're standing. And then this was from last quarter, which we did not get to discuss. So you will see that um, our revenue at that point in time when this was created was at 6.7 million. So we have had a nice increase since that and our balance forward came in so that is also different on this than this so you will get that when we get the new quarter and our expenditures are at currently 3.6 million however we are working on our first quick connect from briarwood and that will bump us to over four million dollars in expenditures and i know anthony will go into further detail on that is there any questions? Okay, uh, Crystal, thank you very much for your always riveting um, budget <laughs> graph. Thank you. Um, okay, so that was the monthly revenue graph and the quarterly financial statement. So now we'll go on to item D, quarterly save our Indian River Lagoon project performance table update from Terry. From Terry. Uh, good morning, give me just Terry, one second to pull it up. Yeah, while Terry shares her screen, um, I talked to the chair about you know how we could try to keep this meeting short like the committee had asked us to. Uh, I know that presentation has been very lengthy in the past, so we're just going to show you, uh, Terry is gonna talk about the eight projects that have been completed um, during the last quarter. Yep, so can everybody see my screen okay? Okay, great. Um, so this, uh, this is from October to December 2020, and we had eight uh, different stormwater projects completed. Oh, let me see if my mouse wants to move. Oh, there we go. Um, so our first two we did, well, most of them were uh, BAM projects, which are biosorption activated media, which is a mixture of sand and uh, wood chips and other types of material that help reduce um, the nutrients from stormwater projects. So in particular here we have Basin 51. This is up off of Johns Road near the Veterans Memorial Cemetery in Mims. And um, you can see here, this is the band material here that's installed. And then there's a layer of stones put on top of it to keep it in place. And then the, this will be infiltrated later as a stormwater uh, pond area. Um, the next one is Basin 100. Uh, this is off of Berkham Road in Mims. Same thing, the band material is underneath of the stones here. And then these larger stones are put in to kind of slow the flow so the water will go through that material and then uh, reduce the nutrients even further. 
Um, we have Basin 193. This one's off of Wiley Road in Mims. And this one created like a mini pond here um, that has the BAM material underneath. And then we have Basin 141, which is a wood chip bioreactor, similar thing as a BAM project. And this is off of Irwin Avenue in Mims. Here's the BAM material underneath. And then um, this is kind of the final product. This green is just uh, grass seed that was put down uh, to help uh, stabilize the shoreline a little bit. Um, these next two projects are also BAM projects. Um, Basin 1298 is off of Wickham and Basin 1304 is in Satellite Beach. And these are solar powered uh, pumps that draw the water out of the stormwater pond and filter it through the BAM material, which is underneath the stones here and here. And then it goes back into uh, the stormwater pond. So extra treatment. And then our last two, we have um, Coco and Titusville both did floating wetland projects. Um, Coco's is off of Pineda Street and Titusville's is up at the Osprey Wastewater Treatment Plant Facility in their stormwater pond. And so they put these mats out and with the plants on it and the plants take up the nutrients from the stormwater pond and then they're harvested usually about every year and that removes the nutrients from the system. And so overall, we've completed uh, eight more projects in the, um, that, the October to December quarter. We had 94 contracts executed. Um, we still have scopes of work coming in every day. So contracts are getting executed um, pretty regularly. And we've spent almost 21 million um, on projects alone. And this doesn't take into account Crystal's numbers that she just mentioned with the almost 4 million for the last quarter. So that is pretty much all I have. Are there any questions? All right, looks like uh, there are no questions. Terry, great job. No questions, knocked it out of the park. Thank you. All right. So um, now we'll move on to uh, other reports and special presentations of the agenda. Our first report comes from uh, Dr. Jacoby, uh, water quality report. Thank you. Let me see if I can make this happen here. So hopefully you're seeing the PowerPoint. Not any good, thank you. Um, yeah, so um, I'm just gonna give you a little brief update on things that have been happening in this, mainly from the water quality standpoint in the lagoon. Okay, so take you back to early last year so early last year conditions were pretty good in and around the lagoon. Um, a couple of ways that we measure that. One here is sound chlorophyll, which is a way that we look at phytoplankton biomass. So chlorophyll being the pigment that they use to convert sunlight to um, their tissue, uh, the single celled algae. And if you look, and particularly if you come from the south up, you'll see that there are a lot of sort of turquoise dots on the map, and that corresponds to relatively low chlorophylls, down around 10 micrograms per liter. Whereas um, 30 or so is you know when we used to talk about how blooms go, but we've seen uh, some in the recent past blooms up around 100 micrograms per liter. So anyway, in early 2020, things were pretty good. Um, chlorophylls were pretty low most places, and that translates into good water clarity. So one of the ways we look at that is to do what's called secchi depth, which is you lower a black and white disc into the water column and take a and measure where it goes out of sight. And so secchi depths around then were like a meter plus, so that's a, well over three feet. Some were at the bottom, so that's you know secchi depths bottom out at, when it reaches the substrate. Um, a couple of places down a little south of Melbourne and up near the tributaries were a little cloudy, but generally speaking, pretty clear. So why was that? Well, one of the primary drivers was rainfall. So 
early 2020 was dry. So this is a, a showing you the monthly departure for March 2020. And you can see it's in that kind of orange red, which is sort of three or four inches below the normal, long-term normal. So dry weather helps the lagoon stay clear. Um, we've kind of known about that relationship. We've seen that kind of thing over time. This is a graph that shows you the extent of seagrasses and acres. Um, many of you have seen something like this before. So the green bars are how many acres of seagrass are out there. Um, you can see that it starts to climb. The acreage is in increases from about 1992 on. Um, a couple of reasons for that. Well, almost some good management. So decreasing wastewater treat plant, treatment plant discharges, um, dealing with discharges from some of the water control districts, but it also had to do with the weather. So there was a fair bit of dry weather and the rains that did occur um, like the 2004 hurricanes or tropical storm Fay tended to be big, heavy rains that seemed to sort of flush the lagoon and cause less difficulty than the average rainfall tends to. So that, given all that short-term and long-term relationship, it wasn't a big surprise that um, when the rain started, sort of June and July, and this shows you that departure again, departure index for July, and you can see now it's up in the sort of mauve and purple range, which is plus four or five inches above normal. Um, when those rains started, we started to see issues. So by August, this is a satellite image where we've taken um, the wavelengths that come to the satellite and we've used those to model chlorophyll concentrations. So the hotter colors, the more orange colors are higher chlorophylls. Um, and you can see that in the Northern Indian River Lagoon, chlorophyll levels were increasing up in that sort of 80 range and above. So we began to see a bloom as the rains came. That bloom actually um, lasted. Uh, it's, it actually it expanded as it were. So it started in the Northern Indian River Lagoon, that Mosquito the Lagoon started to bloom, Banana River Lagoon started to bloom. And so by the left-hand satellite image, these are what we call true color images. So that's kind of what your eye would see from space. Um, the green being the bloom. So that's the left-hand images from the 15th of October. Um, by that time, the bloom was pretty widespread, pretty intense. It started to fade later in the year. So that second image is from the 25th of November. And that, as the bloom fades, the algae die, the bacteria start to decompose their bodies. And um, we had a fish kill over the Thanksgiving holiday. We were lucky. Um, that, needless to say, led to a lot of scrambling around trying to find folks to um, deal with the issues. Um, the third image is from the 6th of December, and that's when the bloom started to fade in Banana River Lagoon, and the red circle sort of indicates the fact that the, the part of the IRL where the bloom had faded stayed clear. So we had another smaller fish kill then. Now, fish kills and um, crashes of algal blooms go to hand in hand, and that's because of the relationship with dissolved oxygen in the water column. So this is some data from one of the, a couple of the continuous monitoring devices that district has out there, one near Coco and one in Banana River Lagoon. And so here you can see, if you think back, the bloom started to crash um, in November around Coco, and you can see that the dissolved oxygen, that green line drops, and it drops into that sort of orange zone at the bottom, which is two milligrams of oxygen per liter or below. And that's when um, aquatic organisms like fish and so forth are stressed. So you can see that it stayed down there for um, a fair while. And that was the larger fish kill. Same sort of thing happened in Banana River Lagoon a little later in December. The oxygen started dropping around the 8th of December and it stayed down below two for probably about half a day. So we had another smaller fish kill. Um, I guess fortunately you could say um, the weather got drier um, early in 2021. So this is, again is one of those departure indices from January 2021. And you can see that it's an inch or two below the long-term normal. 
And when that happened, conditions in the lagoon started to improve. Um, this is the chlorophyll values again. So you're looking here for places where dots go from being either um, orange or red or that sort of darker green to being blue or the, the sort of turquoise. And again, particularly if you look at most of the southern part of the lagoon, the shift <clears throat> is there, less chlorophyll in the water column. The red arrow kind of points out where things lagged a bit up in the northern Indian River Lagoon and southern Mosquito Lagoon. So the chlorophyll didn't drop there as quickly. <clears throat> Secchi depths also as chlorophyll fades away improve. So you see red and orange dots turn into blue and turquoise and green dots. <clears throat> Again, there's a bit of a lag up in the northern IRL and southern Mosquito Lagoon. <clears throat> so why do we have that <clears throat> kind of lag? Well, residence time, as we call it, or how long the water stays before it's moved. Um, is one of the reasons. This is a output from what our model that outputs what we call mean water age in days. Um, this is a, kind of an average over the period from January 2009 to January 2013. Um, and the key point, I guess, is that um, those portions where you, we saw that lag, they have a residence time on the average of about a year. Um, and there are other parts like in Banana River Lagoon where you can have residence time for two or two and a half years. So water stays in there, nutrients are there for the phytoplankton and so forth. Um, wanted to just go back and take you back to the long-term picture. So again, we've seen blooms um, off and on since 2011 that were the 2011 bloom we used to call the super bloom because it was more intense, there was higher chlorophyll values, more numbers of phytoplankton, and um, lasted longer and was more right, widespread than things we had seen in the previous 20 or so years. But we've had other blooms in 2012, 16, 19, and then the recent bloom in, 2000, in 2020. So what does all this mean? The usual question I get whenever I wave my arms. So I think the take homes are the system is both special and vulnerable and some of the things that make it that are the same, things like residence time. You know, that's one of the reasons you have the diversity you have because the water isn't flowing through like a river, um, but it also makes it vulnerable. Um, we've certainly seen that events matter. Um, a lot of our management, you know, because, it, because it kind of has to be almost, um, looks at the average, that's what we're managing. Um, but we now have a very clear understanding that some of these events can move things. So there has seemed to have been a shift in the way the system's functioning and um, a range of things that we're exploring about that shift, most of which make it challenging to restore. So it's, it's become a little harder than it might've been. But given all that, nutrients and chlorophyll still remain the issue. And I think the key take home message is to just stay the course. Um, things are on the right track and we just stay with it. Why would I say that that, that might be of value and that might work out? <clears throat> One of the things we have is a model um, that will model water quality, hydrodynamics and water quality. So how the water moves and we're able to you know, simulate growth phytoplankton. Um, these two graphs are just a couple of places in Banana River Lagoon where the line is what the model put out in terms of chlorophyll concentrations and the red boxes were measured chlorophyll concentrations. So like all models, it tends to fall short on hitting the peaks, but it has the same sort of pattern. So we have some faith in the fact that trying to encapsulate our understanding of the system into a model where we can look at how different scenarios might play out will work. So we have some faith in this model as a, an ability to look forward. One of the things that we have done was to look at Banana River Lagoon in particular and two scenarios, ran it in the sort of current condition and looked at chlorophyll um, in June 2011. So that's kind of average for the month. And again, the hotter colors are more chlorophyll. So it's pretty hot in Banana River Lagoon and Northern IRL, pretty high chlorophyll concentrations. But then also they took the loads of nutrients that go into the model that 
drive, feed those phytoplankton in the model. And they lowered all of those loads to the, what the TMDL is set as the target and reran the model. And as you can see for June, um, it's much cooler, right? So the model, there's not as much chlorophyll. So we have some faith in the fact that moving towards and getting to that TMDL will help us with our issues about algal blooms. Now, the bloom did occur, but it was well and truly delayed. And that's the super bloom time, 2011. Um, that was the kickoff of some of the events we've seen. And so moving that back, shortening that duration um, will would have made a pretty important important difference to the conditions in the lagoon. So just quickly, kind of where are you now in terms of this? So this is my effort to extract the information from the recent evaluation of the basin management action plans, and their loads of total nitrogen are the is the upper left graph with uh, the green bars. Darker bars are where loads started. The um, middle bar is where you where things were in 2019, and the lighter bar on the right hand side that's the target, and then the lower left is the total phosphorus. So if you look at the percentages, they're, they're where 2019 was relative to the target. So somewhere between 21 percent for um, Banana River Lagoon total phosphorus to 65 percent towards the target for the St. Lucie and total nitrogen. So things are moving. Things are, you know, are going in the right direction. And thank you. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Dr. Jacoby. The, the modeling uh, progress, that's, that's impressive. That would be uh, great to get that model uh, nailed in. So do we have any uh, questions uh, for Dr. Jacoby? We do, Lorraine Koss. And I'll remind everybody again, we're gonna use the raise hand feature so if you can't see it, if you open your participants window, there should be a button down at the bottom that says raise hand. Um, so uh, Lorraine. Yeah, uh, Dr. Jacoby, I noticed on one of your slides, the residence time right around the bridge, I think it's a 520 bridge, was pretty high. It was like a, a small area that was high. And um, I'm wondering if, because I sit on the TPO, the Space Coast Transportation Planning Organization, and although it's in the future, um, we did vote to start the design of raising the, um, getting away from the causeways to help increase the flow. So, you know, we had, um, couple months ago um, voted to do that on 528, but now looking forward on 520, hopefully it's in my lifetime, but um, um, you would anticipate that that would help that area as well? So um, the causeways in the bigger picture um, probably don't impede flow as much as you might think they would. Um, in part because the things that drive water movement in the lagoon are mainly wind, a little bit of tide. And so you, you just don't have huge volumes of water trying to shift from one spot to another. So the gaps are big enough for the water to get through. They just, just moves a little faster. But locally, and again, the model probably doesn't, in this particular, that residence time, the model cells are probably a little too large to really see something like the structure of a causeway. Um, but you would probably see localized effects. And so again, you know, there are kind of swings and roundabouts for these things. Okay. Okay, thank you. Uh, Charlie. Yeah, thanks. Hey, Dr. Jacoby, on one of your data points regarding the dissolved oxygen, the uh, sites of Cocoa and the Banana River Lagoon seem to track each other pretty well. Then you got to the far end of that chart and there was a big gap between the Banana River Lagoon and the Cocoa dissolved oxygen. Uh, I was curious to what you think caused that and apparently it, it probably came back together after those data points. Right. Um, so yeah, the far right, which is in December, um, the Banana River Lagoon line went down and the um, 
Cocoa line went up. Let me see if I can get this back for you here. So on the on the far right here, um, you saw the Banana River Lagoon drop. Um, that's where the bloom started to crash. But there was a bit more bloom went on in cocoa. So the phytoplankton started to reproduce a little bit more again. And when there are phytoplankton in the water and they have sunlight, they produce oxygen as a byproduct of their photosynthesis. And so that's why oxygen levels will tend to increase when there's phytoplankton around. So that's the split. One place was going up with algae, the other place was going down. Okay. Um, all right. Any other questions for Dr. Jacoby? All right. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Jacoby. You're welcome. All right. Well, we'll move on. Thank you. We'll move on to the next uh, communications transparency project from Becky Clarkson. Hey, everyone. Good morning. Can you hear me okay? Great. I'm going to go ahead and Thanks, Vinny. Pardon me while I get my screen share set up here. All right. Let's see. Oh, I think that I just closed. All right, can everybody see my screen okay? Yeah, yeah, you're good. Great, perfect. Well, it's a pleasure to be here today. It's great to see you all on video. I'm excited to be able to talk a little bit about the TDC Lagoon Grant Transparency Strategy the department has been working on for the past year or so. Um, I'll go ahead and I have probably put together a few too many slides to try and cram into a short presentation. So pardon me as I fly through things a little bit quickly. Feel free to stop and and ask questions at any point, and I'll try to save a little bit of time at the end for questions as well. Um, the project itself is a little bit of a mouthful. The best way that I can describe our objective is that we set out to research, develop, and test a database, whoop, a database strategy to increase transparency for lagoon health information for residents and lagoon-related tourism information for tourists. We had a multi-part strategy to help achieve this objective. We started with information gathering surveys. We then conducted surveys for residents and tourists, created messaging and materials, and then we're testing those through focus groups and we'll be issuing a final report and recommendations at the end of this month. Transparency is a critical component of the Lagoon recovery process. We developed this chart as part of the original grant application to kind of show its role through the lagoon, the lagoon recovery cycle. And if you follow along on this relatively complex looking cycle, um, increased transparency creates increased exposure to lagoon related health project, health and project information, which helps uncover new ideas, innovation. Yes. Your screens are not, your slides are not advancing for us. Oh no, okay. We're, we're still on your intro slide. Oh, okay, let me see what I can do. Um, I'm going to try a different screen share option real quickly. It's working, mm -hmm. it's working now, Becky. It's where we see the project overview now. Okay, shoot. Let me try. I'm going to just stay at a full screen mode and no. see if I if, do you see. Okay. Okay. Thank right. you. Your cycle now. Perfect. The fun of Zoom technical challenges. All right, we'll stick with this and see if it works. So back to the complicated cycle. That's great because it helps to have the visual for this for sure. Um, so again, increasing exposure to information leads to new resources, new labor sources, new efficiencies in restoring the lagoon, which allows soil projects to be completed more quickly and efficiently, which enables lagoon health to improve more quickly and efficiently, leading to greater appeal for tourism, increased tourism and increased tourism and sales tax revenues, which benefits both our local economy and continues to fund soil projects. So we kind of see a pretty 
robust cycle here with transparency being a key role in the wheel. In addition to helping inform residents through transparency, if we're able to increase tourism related information, it again fuels tourism and continues to help this cycle continue. I'm just making sure that my slide ex advanced. Are we still good on, on you tech? You did, it good. It good. Yay, it good. thanks Vinny. All right, so we started with information gathering surveys. We spoke with over 20 related, lagoon related education and outreach agents in our community. We received over 16 responses um, from a variety of different organizations and the insight that we received helped um, inform development of surveys for residents and tourists. Some of the highlights of our information gathering process um, is that we heard um, repeatedly from Lagoon Outreach and Education agents, and this may not be a surprise to many of the people all in this room, um, that residents are concerned about the health of the lagoon. Most aren't aware of the Sorrel program, and residents have very specific questions that come up time and time again, um, which are often, what's being done to help the lagoon? When will lagoon health improve? How can Lagoon Health be improved more quickly? And what can I personally do to help the Lagoon? So one of the key consensus that we found in compiling this original information gathering was that more information is needed about Lagoon Health projects that are currently underway and well, ways that individuals can help the Lagoon. Because more information can lead to increased engagement, which can lead to Lagoon Health improving more quickly. So the resident survey, we had actually a relatively tremendous response. We had over 1900 completed responses, which was pretty remarkable considering the survey itself was seven to 10 minutes in length and that there was no advertised paid incentive or bonus for participating in the survey itself. Um, we distributed the survey across a variety of channels to um, both reduce bias, but also to test the, the viability of different distribution and advertising channels. Uh, so we used Facebook, Instagram, Florida Today, and Space Coast Daily, both print and digital, um, as well as the Google network for different types of digital advertising. We also shared the survey on Facebook and Instagram through various groups and also distribution through email lists to a variety of groups. The next few slides I'm gonna go over quickly just to show you a variety of the types of advertising that we ran. Um, we tried to use, to maximize our funding to um, really analyze both the, mess the channels that we were using, but also the types of imagery and messaging that we are incorporating as well, because this will ultimately inform our overall strategy and maximize our spend. So we did a variety of images on Facebook, as well as a different types of targeting strategies. We did a variety of animated images on Florida Today, um, as well as Google. And this is a version of a print ad that we ran in Space Coast Daily and Florida Today. And we did a variety of different types of animated solutions on Google and also some geofenced options. The resident survey results itself, we had a really successful mix of both paid and unpaid response sources. This is pretty indicative of um, a, a quality data set. You never wanna have too many responses that come from just one paid source or just paid sources alone. Um, so we definitely had a very healthy um, split mix of people that took the survey, you know, that we sourced through organic channels, like sharing through your friend or referent group online versus paid advertising like Google or Facebook ads. 63% of our responses came from social media, primarily Facebook and Instagram, which is pretty typical because it's one of the cheapest, most affordable and cost-effective ways of advertising digitally nowadays. The final report will take more detailed cost analysis of all of this so to help inform future survey promotion efforts. Out of the resident survey, I've thrown a few slides here that highlight key findings. I could probably talk for a few hours about this. I'm gonna do it very quickly. Um, but our resident survey had a very healthy demographics mix. I didn't throw that in here, but it was relatively census balanced. We normally see age groups in the 55 to 65 extremely highly represented in surveys about the lagoon. In this case, we had a small bump in that demographic, but not anywhere as near as pronounced as what we've seen in the past. And also different from past surveys, we were able to reach an audience that reported, 36% of them reported no information from many of our top 
lagoon education and advocacy groups, which is a real departure from surveys in years past. Um, and because it's been challenging to um, reach an audience that isn't already engaged in, in lagoon related efforts when we're distributing surveys through channels that tend to go through lagoon related organizations. I'll, we can talk more about this a little bit further on, but it was significant that we were speaking to an audience that reported a relatively low exposure to these types of lagoon education and advocacy groups. Um, of primary interest knowing this information is that we see very similar patterns in ratings of the health of the lagoon and concern for the lagoon. So um, on a scale of zero to 10, we do see very low ratings a three out of 10 and also nine out of 10 for concern about lagoon health. Um, we asked a variety of questions. One of the, the significant things that we noticed in reasons that people choose to live in Brevard County is that all five of the top responses were outdoor related reasons and lagoon related activities actually ranked as the third highest reason to choose Brevard as a place to live. Um, also significant is that 84% of responses were interested or maybe interested in learning more about ways they can personally help the lagoon and 97% were interested or maybe interested in learning more about a countywide program to improve the health of Lagoon, which obviously would be good news for Sorrel and Lagoon Loyal, as well as additional programs in our county. Related to um, information frequency, we asked a variety of questions that we can use for inferential analysis to look at the importance of communication in people's perceptions and awareness of various Lagoon related items in our area. One of the most significant patterns that I've uncovered so far is that information frequently, the more, pe the more frequently people receive information about the lagoon, the higher they report awareness about sorrel and tax, sales tax use, and the higher their perception is about the sorrel program as well. So this is definitely a good check on the hypothesis that increased transparency does lead to increased engagement and increased um, affinity for, for lagoon related restoration efforts. We collected information about a variety of topics that people may want to hear about lag the lagoon and lagoon health related causes. The ones that reached most highly were in agreement with the type of information we had originally received from our lagoon education and outreach officers. And we'll show you in a few slides how we're using this information to incorporate in messaging and creative concepts. Just quickly of interest to note is that our highest trusted source that came back with responses was UF IFAS, um, preferred channels or email or e-newsletter and websites. We tend to expect that, but it was also still interesting to see it validated as well as social media, while being a relatively preferred channel in, in relation to others, has a relatively low source of trust. And yet 75% of our respondents are very active on Facebook. So jumping quickly into the tourist survey, um, this tourist survey, we had over a thousand completed responses. It was slightly shorter than the resident survey and we targeted it to our six key drive markets throughout Florida and also Atlanta, Georgia. Um, we advertised it also through Facebook and Instagram through Visit Space Coast channel and also tried a variety of Google and geofenced advertising to try and reach tourists that were visiting in our area. We ran a variety of different types of visual imagery through face, Visit Space Coast social media channels so that we could test messaging and which types of imagery most um, tourists most were most responsive to. Some of the interesting highlights out of this survey, um, we asked a variety of questions about the Indian River Lagoon. And it was interesting to note that we got the responses we heard where the Indian River Lagoon is um, both a relaxing place to visit and an outdoor adventure destination ranked most highly, but it ranked, people reported that it um, is not well advertised, which, you know, is kind of interesting coming from tourism uh, respondents that received most of this survey through advertising. Also interesting of note is that our survey respondents in this survey skewed quite a bit lower than what we normally see in tourism related surveys. Um, one of the goals was to try and reach people that 
have traveled to our area or are interested in traveling and may also be interested in recreating on the lagoon. Um, so we anticipated seeing some shift in the age demographics, but as you can see with this slide, over 62% of our respondents were ages 25 to 44. Oftentimes our tourism um, data set skews a little bit higher than this in age ranges. Um, so it is a little bit interesting and we collected enough data that we can um, analyze uh, dub, sub data sets that kind of give us a normal mix of what we receive in tourism surveys. So we can also kind of benchmark that against other tourism surveys. But this was one of the first surveys that really dove into how, what Indian, what tourism activities are um, participated in on the lagoon. So it contains a variety of new information and will be helpful in the future for other benchmarking for the tourism office. Um, just a few more quick slides about the tourism survey itself. Because we were collecting quite a bit of information about what people do on the lagoon when they're here in our area, um, it was interesting to note that 62% of people reported engaging in beach activities and then 26 and 25% also said that they recreated on the water or on a shoreline other than the beach. So this is in line with expectations. We know that beach tourism is a very high driver of our tourism market, but it was interesting to see that, you know, a little less than half of those people also may have been participated in tourism activities on the lagoon while they were here. Of those activities they participated on, in the lagoon. Um, this is a further breakdown of what people said that they did on the water or shoreline. And it, it's interesting to note just that there was a wide range of activities um, that were recorded. One thing interesting to note just in this survey is that particular categories like volunteerism and ecotourism, as well as night bioless bioluminescent night paddling, we threw in there. Um, in people that had visited the lagoon and reported activities, their reported participation in next, these activities is relatively low. But when we asked them at the end of the survey, how interested would you be in a variety of activities? These two activities in particular, their percentage rates of interest in participation increased substantially over the course of the survey. There's a few different reasons that this type of um, observation <laughs> can occur. Um, it could be because we had a larger data set that we're reporting about what type of activities they'd like to participate on the lagoon in the future, but it could also be due in part to the fact that just sheerly learning about the fact that ecotourism and volunteerism exist, and as well as bioluminescent nighttime paddling exist as options, just knowing that those exist may be reasons for why the participation interest has increased over the survey. I'll write this up in a much more concise way in the final report, but there were some very interesting data points in the survey that I think will be helpful to note for future reference. Um, jumping into quickly some creative concepts that we're currently reviewing in focus groups. Um, the TDC and Lagoon Manatee Map Project is one that overlaps very nicely with the Transparency Project. So we have created a manatee um, viewing map, both a, a printed flat wall display poster, as well as a four by nine rat card that folds out to a very large um, directive map that has highlights of different viewing spots throughout the county for, for public viewing spots for manatees. This piece contains a variety of information about um, manatees, their habitat, as well as unique features about the species. And we feel like it's a unique opportunity to be able to educate both residents and tourists while enabling and building um, tourism throughout our county. This is an exploded view of the map just to show the level of detail and information that it contains because it's difficult to see on screen. To help address some of the high priority information that was requested both in the survey and our information gathering process, we've created a series of detailed infographics. This is a bit of a Where's Waldo experience intentionally. The idea is to try and highlight a variety of information in one illustrated infographic piece and test this with the public to see if it helps convey the 
a depth of information about sources of pollution and how each of those sources affect the lagoon and lagoon health, um, what the SORL program is doing to address lagoon health, actions residents can take to help the lagoon, as well as ways to learn more and get involved. The next page just has an exploded view of some of the information in this infographic. As you can see, there's a lot of detail. We've color coded various things. The darker blue is what the SORL program is doing to help the lagoon and the lighter blue is what individuals can do to help the lagoon. The left side is kind of intended to show pollution sources. The right side shows what people can do and what the SORL program is doing to improve lagoon health. We've also thrown in some different types of visual infographics to test with residents to see which types of elements resonate to help convey these concepts more effectively. Another piece that we're currently testing is a series of flyers, educational handouts related to stormwater behaviors. As Vinny noted earlier in our conversation today, stormwater behaviors are complex, but it's also one of the behavior sets that has a high um, impact on lagoon health. So this is an example of a flyer related to fertilizer behaviors. It has a tear off component that includes a pledge card where people are able to commit to different types of fertilizer lagoon friendly fertilizer behaviors and it has a tear off portion that they can retain and place in their wallet its credit card size and it has reminders of the different types of lagoon friendly behaviors that they can engage in year round to help the lagoon. So this is currently being tested to see if it is something that the audience that our audience would be interested in in using and potentially keeping in their wallet as a reminder of ways to help the lagoon. We're also testing different types of signage. Um, these are some examples of yard signage. Um, ideas range from individual behaviors to having some type of yard signage where there are different types of stickers that people could apply showing the different types of behaviors that they're engaging in to help the lagoon. This is a solution that's really based on social science um, to, to enable different types of actions that we would, to lagoon friendly actions in our in a population, um, placing some type of signage that is near the behavior that is being taken is proven to be an effective way to kind of help both prompt, but also create a social norm and social diffusion around that behavior. So we're trying to evaluate different ways of using social science to help encourage various lagoon friendly activities in our communities. And finally, this is an example of testing different types of preferred messengers. You can see we have a variety of people over on the right. This is one subset of what we're evaluating. We have a very well-renowned and respected local businesswoman and a lagoon activist, as well as a local scientist and um, <laughs> lagoon advocate. So we're trying to evaluate, you know, what type of messengers, channels, and sources are people most interested in receiving lagoon information through. So our final report that will be issued at the end of the month will contain a detailed analysis of survey results and feedback from our focus groups, recommendations for information types, channels, and frequency based on research surveys and focus groups, as well as strategic recommendations to help increase transparency for the Lagoon Health Information, the SORL program, and lagoon-related tourism. That was the end. I hope I didn't talk too fast. I tried to do it quickly. I'd welcome any questions if anybody hasn't we'd like to talk about today. All right. Uh, thank you, Becky. Uh, anyone have any questions on the uh, uh, Charlie? Yeah. Hey, that, that was a wonderful presentation. I was wondering if just from a methodology uh, approach, were you able to uh, filter out people who may try to do duplicate uh, surveys? Definitely. Yes. We um, we have different types of tracking involved with the survey itself. Like, there's a balance between. Um, preserving anonymity, but also doing enough tracking that you can filter out uh, replicative or duplicative responses. So yes, I'm able to filter out that type of information without kind of compromising anonymity in our survey responses. And because there wasn't a prize incentive involved and the surveys themselves did take quite a bit of time, there also wasn't a great incentive to take the survey more than once. We do see that quite a bit when there are prizes involved, but in this case, the incidence rate was very low. <laughs> All right, uh, thank you, Charlie. Uh, Dennis. 
Hey, Benny, can you hear me? Hello? Yes, we can. Yep, you're good. Becky, uh, uh, on the chart that showed uh, the ages were 25 to 44, just out of curiosity, when was this survey done? Great question. So it was conducted between, um, it started in January and we closed at the end of February of, of this year. Of this year. Yes, yes. It was very recent, so. Yeah, my, my question is, is it skewed to a younger age group because of COVID? Partially, yes. That's a, a great observation. There's a couple reasons for this. Um, partly, we, we evaluated different types of recruitment channels than what has traditionally been used um, by our tourism surveys in the past. So we actually used different types of panel services that showed the survey promotion on video game platforms, as well as different types of social media that we wouldn't normally reach out to. Um, and part of this, again, was trying to reach an audience that was targeted to people that were interested in outdoor related activities. So um, again, we, the data set is large enough that we can pare it down. Obviously, we can analyze specific age groups and we can analyze at you know different types of income levels and those sorts of things. Pretty much anything that you want to analyze, we can do. Um, so if you have any special requests, let me know. But um, COVID definitely does have a uh, an effect. We did see um, ask some questions about how recently you had traveled to the Space Coast, and normally we would see a very high incidence rate of recent travel, and that was not as um, indicative in in this data set as it has been with obviously tur tourism surveys in years past. Okay, great. Thank you. All right. Thank uh, you, David Dennis. Lane. Uh, David Lane. Hi there. Hey, uh, great presentation. I wanted to ask um, how you guys went about selecting your geographies for the tourists. Um, it looked like you had chosen Tampa and Atlanta. And I was just trying to get a better understanding of your rationale for that selection. Yeah, that also is a great question. So we worked closely with the tourism department with their recommendations and um, tried to kind of collect data that was in line with what they've done in the past as well so that we could have not necessarily a comparative data set, but something that was at least similar so that we could kind of look at um, surveys that they've done in the past, looking at cruise and tourism and hotel markets versus kind of how a similar market engages with the lagoon. So we chose our largest drive markets and that's where that Atlanta, Georgia and Tampa came into play. Um, the tourism office has a lot of information about highest incidence of um, drive in tourism. And due to COVID, we wanted to kind of kind of, uh, calibrate our data set knowing that our fly in market is not as high as it is in a normal times and our drive-in market is a little bit higher than we have seen in years past. So um, I didn't drop the, the map in here because the presentation was already so long, but I do have a map that pinpoints the zip codes of all of the people that took the survey. And it is actually well distributed through Florida, despite having tried to target those specific drive markets. Um, and again, that um, it's indicative in talking to the tourism office and how, um, you know, they track tourism in our area um, that we do receive a lot of drive-in market for lagoon related activities. Um, having a, a resource like the lagoon so close to so many markets in our state um, does result in it being a relatively attractive place for people to drive into for recreation purposes and travel. Uh, thank you for that. It, it, it conflicts a little bit with my experience. I'm in the tourism business. Um, a, a lagoon based tourism business. And um, my biggest constituency by far, um, and this is reported annually over the last 15 years, is people from the Midwest. It's not people from Tampa. It's not people from Georgia. Um, it's Midwest and, and secondarily to that North Atlantic states. So um, that's, that's my experience. And I was kind of a little bit surprised to see that 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 wasn't you know represented more, um, and uh, um, <clears throat> I don't know that their views would be different. I just uh, I thought the the uh, geographies chosen were were out of sync with what we experience um, in our business. Yeah, 
That's really interesting, David. Thanks for sharing that. Um, you know, we can talk a little bit more too, if you want to uh, uh, offline about kind of the methodology. Um, I think one of the challenges also is looking at cost effectiveness of reaching those different types of markets. When we spoke at the tourism office about reaching through markets through the mid-Atlantic states as well as the Midwest, um, we had a variety of conversations about their past experience in trying to collect data from those markets and the, the costs associated with finding good data sets from those areas. So that was definitely a consideration and things that came up in conversation and might be an interesting um, item to note in the report for a future analysis as well. Thank you. Always feel free to reach out to me. I deal with tourists every day and we get about uh, 40,000 of them a year. So uh, we've got pretty good data ourselves. So I'm happy to help out anytime uh, you want it. Thanks, David. Okay. Um, thank you, uh, David. Anyone else with questions? Um, I, I had one question, Becky. I, I, I'm a big proponent of communications, anyone that knows me. Um, and it's something that you have to tell people what you're going to do, you have to do it, and then you have to tell them you've done it. And then a couple months later, you got to remind them you've done it. Um, and the thing is, the communication is a job that never stops because there's always competition for attention. And so uh, the flyers and stuff that you did look beautiful. Um, it was really nice. Dennis made a comment uh, earlier, and we were talking, I think, last month about putting some uh, Brevard Indian River Lagoon Coalition flyers at the closing offices um, for people that are moving into the area. And so I didn't know if your report dealt with um, delivery methods uh, of, of those flyers because they look great, a lot of information. Everybody always wants to know what can I do, what can I do. And if you have this beautiful piece of artwork with lots of information and it's sitting on a table or on a shelf somewhere not being used, um, you know, it's just kind of, uh, it's hard to reach out and get those people. So does your, does your report, Becky, involve uh, delivery methods? And if so, has there been any thought towards that? Yes, definitely. Thanks for asking, Vinny. So um, there's a, a couple of different components to all of this. Uh, the manatee piece itself, obviously, because it's more tourism related, we've spoken with the different um, rat car distribution uh entities in town. So that's an easy way to kind of distribute to tourism related channels. With the, you know, the stormwater specific type of information, you're right. Um, we looked into, you know, in normal normal times, um, we do have outreach officers through, through various organizations that are doing event outreach. And that was one of the key drivers that we were considering for this type of information. Oftentimes at events is a great way to kind of have more in-depth conversations with people about the effects of stormwater behaviors on lagoon health. And a lot of the printed materials that you've seen here are kind of intended for that type of environment, which obviously, you know, is looking a little bit towards the future, but we do have some lead time to be able to create that type of information um, if we're able to create it now with this particular grant, or at least the strategy for that creation. In an ideal world, um, a lot of this information would have digital components. Um, I'm a digital strategist primarily, so creating print design is not necessarily what I would really recommend. So in our recommendations, um, that was gonna be a key component is how to translate all of this information to a digital solution. This the budget that was outlaid in this grant didn't have um, allocations for implementation of digital solutions, um, but the idea was to create a strategy and recommendations for how to, um, you know, how to generate data-based information and then how to distribute it through appropriate channels. So the surveys themselves give us very clear directives about what type of information people would like and how they would like to receive it um, through which channels. And so the goal really right now is to analyze the information that we've created based on those surveys and then make recommendations for implementation through those channels in the future. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Um, any other questions? And if not, okay. Um, I, I think that, that one uh, flyer that you had with uh, Kelly Slater and Dr. Windsor, oh, Lorraine has a question. I just think we need to give Dr. Windsor the surfboard. 
Um, that's that's what I was going to say. I think that 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 would sell. I, I would be grabbing fire after fire of that. But uh, it looks like Lorraine has a question. So Lorraine, go. No, ahead. I love this. I love the surfboard idea. But um, no, just for the record, I have to get off the call. So I wanted the record to reflect that Charlie Benuto would be voting in my place. So okay, uh, thank good you. presentation. Thank you. And I'll see you at the next All right, meeting. Uh, Becky. Okay, thank you. Um, Becky, thank you very much for your presentation. Um, there was also an attendee who had a question, and I just want to let you know, we, we only um, take questions from the attendees during general comments or during motions. So I think it was Britta or Brita, if you have a, a question, if you want to get in touch with Virginia, um, or if you stay after, um, we can uh, see if we can get something worked out. So thank you, um, everybody. Becky, thank you for the presentation. Okay, so we will move on to the next thing, which is my lagoon story video from our very own Stephanie Ely. Logan, did you Hold hear on, that? I'm, I'm, I'm playing that. I just got to pull that up. One second. Sorry. lost my way to pull up the, the Zoom meeting. This is weird. <laughs> Hold on one second. Yeah, we can we can go ahead and discuss new yeah. business. Okay. We... All right. Uh, Logan, no rush. We'll uh, take the pressure off you. Um, we're going to go ahead and switch. Let's do new business um, for now while Logan works on the hey, video. I got it. So, uh, <laughs> I, got it. I got it. Vinny. All right. See, I just took the pressure off you and that fixed it. So here we go. Now we're back here to the My Lagoon Story video oh. with Stephanie Healy. Here we go. Um. Okay, I take it back. Sorry, hold on. Um, go ahead and go back to the other thing. Sorry. Okay. All right. No worries. No worries. Okay. So let's start with uh, item 11 uh, under new business. We're going to go with a uh, request for contingency funding to add the Berkeley Canal to the Grand Canal muck removal project. Uh, Virginia or uh, Walker. Good morning, everyone. Um, today we, we brought this agenda item before you um, because the county would like to add the Berkeley Canal to the existing Grand Canal muck removal project. Um, the motion um, is a request. We're requesting a motion to recommend approval of $217,053.20 for funding increase to the Grand Canal Muck Removal Project to add the previously omitted portion of the, um, the, the Berkeley Canal. Um, so essentially, basically, in a nutshell, what, what this particular portion of uh, this canal will do is it's about three acres. Um, it will reduce the, the annual nitrogen flux by 284 pounds and 38 pounds of total phosphorus. And we'll also remove uh, an estimated 470 pounds of nitrogen and 41 pounds of phosphorus from the interstitial water as it's scrubbed before it returns back to the lagoon. Is there anything else you, you think I need to add to that, Virginia? Um, just, just that the the way the contingency fund reserve works is that the committee can uh, make recommendations on on allocations of up to 10% of the project. Um, the way the contingency the amount of funding fund already allocated for that, that project, the committee can uh, make recommendations on Logan, on allocations video of audio up playing. to 10%. Thank you. 
and this request is for 1.2%, so well within that 10% threshold. Okay, uh, Stephanie has her hand up. Yes, I move that we make the recommendation to add the Berkeley Canal to the Grand Canal Muck Removal Project for the contingency funding. I'll second that. Okay, we have a motion and we have a second. So we'll open the floor up for discussion. Uh, does anybody have any uh, discussion? Courtney? I just have one clarification. This is just regular muck, right? Yes. This is not okay, we have a motion waste for we have a second. So we'll open the floor up for discussion. Because that's the predominant. Uh, does anybody have any uh, discussion? I just have one clarification. Logan, this is hey, just Logan, regular muck. Uh, okay, we have a motion. Waste for Okay. Running live TV and Zoom is really hard. I just want everybody to know that and that's watching. It's not an easy task, so don't make fun of us too much. But um, the, uh, the, the do there's a, a rumor going around in Satellite Beach that we're dredging the muck in the Berkeley Canal because it's actually manatee poop. So I just want to make sure everybody knows it's just regular muck. And it's not attributed to manatees particularly. <laughs> so, so yeah, and, and I also think that that warrants some clarification. Just to clarify, uh, you know, the, the Berkeley Canal where the, where the manatees like to hang out mm -hmm. is actually on the east side of South Patrick Drive. We are going to be working in the Finger Canal that leads into Berkeley Canal. Right. So that's everything that's west of South Patrick Drive mm -hmm. out to Grand Canal proper. Right. So and just to clarify. And the so, manatees like to go there because of the natural spring. Is that right. correct? Yeah. Right. Yeah. So that's not the area that the county is judging. So that's correct. Just want to make sure everybody knows that. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, uh, Charlie. appreciate that uh, clarification as one who likes to go watch the manatees there but just from the funding standpoint so with this uh, and as well as the next project is that going to impact any other projects we have on our list I mean will something get bumped or do we have enough contingency within our budget right we 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 set aside five percent so, so. of the cost of all the projects in the plan into that contingency fund and of course some of them use it and some of them don't so that's why the the structure of the plan is to allow uh, tapping into up to 10 percent and this is again 1.2 thank you okay uh any other questions for discussion okay we'll open it up now to attendees if any attendees have any questions before the motion is voted on Okay, looks like there's no questions. Um, so we'll go ahead and take a uh, vote. All those in favor of passing the motion and supporting the uh, additional uh, contingency fund request, say aye. 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 All those opposed? Aye. Okay, looks like it passes unanimously. Okay, and then we will move. Uh, let's just do take care of the next one. Um, and then we'll move back up to the Lagoon Video Story since they're both requests for funding. Um, so uh, item B, request for contingency funding for the city of Melbourne Penwood septic to sewer project. Virginia. And um, the city of Melbourne has a representative uh, in the attendee list. If you have any questions for her, Rebecca Thiebert. Um, so this is sort of a, a similar situation, um, although what, what they are, and this is a septic to sewer project. Um, it was approved back in 2017. Um, the, the costs have, have gone up over the last four or five years. Um, they are requesting less than the total eligible, uh, eligibility um, that they would be eligible for under the, the current plan. So um, that while under the, the current cost share and the updated loadings, the city could request up to 153,900. Um, they're requesting a total of 81,000. Um, 
what was previously contracted was around 40,000. So they're asking for uh, approximately $40,000 increase. Okay, um, thank you. Uh, and I have promoted uh, Rebecca to a panelist in case anybody would like to ask her questions. Um, Stephanie. Again, I move for us to approve, make a recommendation for approval of the contingency funding, especially since it's well under what they could potentially have asked for. Mm -hmm. Okay. I, I will second that motion. Okay, we have Stephanie with a motion and Charles with a second. Um, are there any questions, uh, comment for discussion? Uh, Courtney. I just wanted to point out that it was, so it was estimated to reduce 48 pounds of nitrogen per year. And now they're anticipating an annual reduction of 102.6 pounds per year. So they're basically doubling their projection anyway. So I just wanted to point that out for people who are, you know, out there in the community wondering why the, the cost increased. And, and just to clarify, um, that's based on the uh, additional modeling that the county did in 2018. Okay. Um, so once we did the use the state's arc inlet model and actually modeled the loading from half of the septic systems in Brevard, we got a much better understanding of which distances, which soils, you know, which mm -hmm. conditions led to the highest loading. And so right. um, that's, that's our data that has projected that larger load reduction. Okay, that's great, thank you. Okay, any other uh, questions or comments for discussion? I know for me, um, I looked at it and it was, it was I, had to, I had to wrap my brain around it. This one was eligible for 115,000. So even though we're giving them an additional an amount, they're still under the amount that they're eligible for using the nitrogen calculation. So e even though it seems like it's coming at a higher amount, they're still uh, way under um, what they could be asking for. So uh, that one, that one was, um, was, a, was an important uh, point for me. So with, with no further questions or comments, um, we'll call the question. So uh, all those in favor of, uh, of uh, approving the request for contingency funding for the city of Melbourne's Penwood septic to sewer, say aye. 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 All those opposed? Okay, passes unanimously. Um, thank you everybody. And thank you for Rebecca uh, for coming to the uh, meeting. All right, so Logan, let's go see Miss Stephanie on the big screen. My husband and I grew up in Loveridge in what used to be a galley. And we have countless memories of canoeing and sailing and water skiing on the Indian River Lagoon. And I'm standing right now in the backyard of my husband's childhood home. But probably my first memory was going with my father and brother when my father took us out shrimping late at night with our neighbors. And we weren't afraid to eat what we caught. In March of 2016, we had that devastating fish kill. And it was a wake-up call. For years, scientists had been telling us what we saw dramatically in 2016. The Indian River Lagoon was in trouble. I had just finished my term as president of the Space Coast League of Cities, and the current president, Stuart Glass, asked me if I would be responsible for putting together a symposium, inviting all of the local elected officials, community leaders, and facilitated by scientists Virginia Barker, Dr. Lisa Soto, and Dr. Duane DeFries. At one of our very first meetings, Dr. DeFries coined the phrase, one lagoon, one community, one voice. And that became the headline of our symposium. Out of that committee came the proposal for the half penny sales tax, so that we had a dedicated funding source to fund the restoration project that Virginia Barker had already put together. And that's how Sorrels came about. I'm so proud of the residents of Brevard County for voting that in and providing that funding source. And out of that, I wanted to be part of that oversight committee. I've been incredibly impressed with the caliber of people that are on the Sorrel Committee. And the fact that we are looking at both being fiscally responsible, but also looking at the best science and technology that's out there. 
Our Lagoon plan includes all the elements that are currently putting nutrients into the lagoon and ways that we can get those nutrients back out. It's a comprehensive plan and every aspect of it is important. And those decisions are being impacted by current research that's going on both at FIT and at UCF. I want to thank the residents of Brevard County for being proactive and taking that bold step to tax yourselves. The Indian River Lagoon is one of the most valuable resources that we have in Brevard County. And we need to continue to make sure that that resource is always available and that it's in the best condition that it can possibly be. All right, uh, thank you. Um, and, uh, uh, let me just say that the video, there is beautiful footage. <laughs> <laughs> that should have been changing in the background, but that's that's pretty outstanding that you could speak that smoothly and be that engaging with a frozen still image. <laughs> if I can yes, add, no, I, uh, I thought that was fantastic, Stephanie. Good job. So, Logan, I'm not sure whether the next video is going to work. I do know we'll have Logan start the next video, but these videos are also on the Facebook uh, page, right, Virginia? That's where they go up? Yeah, Brandon's got some formula that he uses for when he posts things for maximizing viewership. Okay, well, on the third full moon of the fourth Wednesday right. of the third yeah. month, on the second yeah. hour of the day, that will be available on Facebook. All right, Logan, let's try the uh, project video, uh, Septic Upgrade. contributor of new nutrients into the Indian River Lagoon. Traditional septic tank only removes... So, Logan, we see a cute little girl with a bunch of cuddly animals. I just want to dive in there, that is and we hear the video. The lagoon ...and feeding those algal... So the All right, well, why don't we, um, we can move on to the uh, legislative session and then we'll go back to the uh, project video. So under new business item C, legislative session, uh, uh, Virginia? Yeah, th this is an item that um, your past chair suggested we put on the agenda. And so, you know, it really was meant to be an open discussion. Of course, the legislative session, um, so much happens every day. There's no way 10 days in advance of putting this agenda together to, to know what are going to be the, the um, hot topics that might be up for discussion today. I did include the, uh, the weekly summary that I had received from the county's lobbyist, um, and I wanted to point out that we do have three bills that have been filed um, in both the House and the Senate for matching funds for, for projects that are funded in the Save Our Indian River Lagoon plan. So there's a $450,000 matching funds request to help with 50 septic upgrades, um, a $585,000 request to assist with 65 quick connects to sewer, and $2.5 million request for the, we call it the, the O'Galley um, muck dredging project. It's in the vicinity of the O'Galley Causeway and the, the little box where you can put your project names in the House and Senate uh, bill requests. Didn't have room for all of that, so Florida 518 Bridge is <laughs> the, the truncated version of that one. Okay, um, thank you. I think I think it is a great idea to um, to have that in the agenda. Um, you know, one of the things that was uh, talked about when this uh, half cent sales tax was passed was the ability to use the money to find matching funds. And so I think I think this is important. Uh, thank you to our uh, representatives um, for sponsoring those bills. Um, and as always, if there's anything we can help, I'm sure everyone on the 
uh, committee is interested um, and, and would be interested in helping out. So, uh, Virginia, thank you. And uh, if you could just keep updating us on those as they move through. I know, like you said, uh, through committee week is crazy, and some stuff flies on consent and some stuff doesn't. So uh, if you keep us updated. That would be great. All right. Uh, any questions for Virginia or comments in general on the legislative session? Vinny, I have a quick question for Please. Virginia. Um, on the three items they just mentioned, um, who are the sponsors for those um, fund requests? So on the Senate side, um, Senator Mayfield is the, the sponsor for all three. On the House side, Representative Fine, uh, is the sponsor for the septic upgrades and the quick connects to sewer. And um, uh, Representative Thad Altman is the, the sponsor for the two and a half million dollar muck request. Thank you. All right. Um, okay. Uh, then let's go ahead and uh, let's give this another go. We'll go for the project video septic upgrade. Septic systems are actually the third largest contributor of new nutrients into the Indian River Lagoon. Traditional septic tank only removes about 30 to 40 percent of the nitrogen that flows through it. The rest of that is making it out into the lagoon and feeding those algal blooms out there. A conventional septic system deals with a septic tank that is set in place basically for settlement of solids. The idea is that only the clear effluent will leave the tank and go into the drain field. What happens over time, people don't don't properly maintain their septic systems, pump them out regularly. The nitrogen basically that's built up in the tank goes out into the drain field and superloads the drain fields. So what we're doing is we're installing a upgraded septic system here and that system can remove anywhere from 65 to as high as 90 percent of the nitrogen depending on the type of system used and the soil in the area. The way the aerobic treatment unit works is it induces air into the tank, basically create aerobic bacteria inside of the tank. The aerobic bacteria work harder than the anaerobic bacteria, and aerobic bacteria meaning with air, anaerobic bacteria meaning without air. When you introduce the air into the, to the water, the aerobic bacteria go to work and they end up cleaning the water. Um, and reducing the nitrogen. Some of the aerobic treatment units that are available reduce the nitrogen higher than 65%. Some only do it in 50%, and then we get the other 15% from separating the drain field from the seasonal high water table. Some of the aerobic treatment units, the way they get their, their treatment and the way they do their treatment is by recirculating the water through the system. And so when we are working with those type of systems, we use drip line dispersal. Drip line dispersal works a little bit different than the drain field where a conventional drain field gravity flows and the, and the water uh, percolates into the soil where the drip system will actually force the water into the soil and we're relying more of more upon the root uptake of the grasses and things because now the, the basically infiltrative surface has moved closer to the surface of the ground. A way to treat it and a way to absorb the waste at this point with a drip system is through the vegetation that's put on top. Property owners along the Indian River Lagoon can contact Brevard County Natural Resources to see if they're eligible for a grant of up to $18,000 to connect to sewer or upgrade to one of these advanced treatment septic systems. These grant funds are provided by the Save Our Indian River Lagoon Program Half Cent Sales Tax to give them an incentive to connect to one of these advanced treatment systems, which really reduces the amount of total nitrogen getting into the groundwater, which eventually makes its way to the lagoon. Septic upgrades are just one of the ways that we're reducing nutrients in the Indian River Lagoon. The Save Our Indian River Lagoon plan is tackling nutrient reduction from all different angles, from septic upgrades and septic removal to wastewater treatment, stormwater treatment, and also muck removal. We're also working to restore some of the natural habitats out there and get those filter feeders back in the system. We also need citizens to help out in their own homes, and you can do so by going to lagoonloyal.com and actually looking at tips and tricks that you can do to reduce your own nutrient footprint. Okay, uh, thank you. That was that was a good good video there. Those septic upgrades. Those are uh, we're doing lots of those. Okay, we are going to give the Stephanie Ely video another go since there are some beautiful pictures we want to see. So this is going to be round two. Uh, Logan, hit it.
My husband and I grew up in Loveridge in what used to be a galley. And we have countless memories of canoeing and sailing and water skiing on the Indian River Lagoon. And I'm standing right now in the backyard of my husband's childhood home. But probably my first memory was going with my father and brother when my father took us out shrimping late at night with our neighbors. And we weren't afraid to eat what we caught. In March of 2016, we had that devastating fish kill. And it was a wake-up call. For years, scientists had been telling us what we saw dramatically in 2016. The Indian River Lagoon was in trouble. I had just finished my term as president of the Space Coast League of Cities, and the current president, Stuart Glass, asked me if I would be responsible for putting together a symposium, inviting all of the local elected officials, community leaders, and facilitated by scientists Virginia Barker, Dr. Lisa Soto, and Dr. Dwayne DeFries. At one of our very first meetings, Dr. DeFries coined the phrase, one lagoon, one community, one voice. And that became the headline of our symposium. Out of that committee came the proposal for the half penny sales tax, so that we had a dedicated funding source to fund the restoration project that Virginia Barker had already put together. And that's how Sorrels came about. I'm so proud of the residents of Brevard County for voting that in and providing that funding source. And out of that, I wanted to be part of that oversight committee. I've been incredibly impressed with the caliber of people that are on the Sorrel Committee. And the fact that we are looking at both being fiscally responsible, but also looking at the best science and technology that's out there. Our Lagoon Plan includes all the elements that are currently putting nutrients into the lagoon and ways that we can get those nutrients back out. It's a comprehensive plan and every aspect of it is important. And those decisions are being impacted by current research that's going on both at FIT and at UCF. I wanna thank the residents of Brevard County for being proactive and taking that bold step to tax yourselves. The Indian River Lagoon is one of the most valuable resources that we have in Brevard County. And we need to continue to make sure that that resource is always available and that it's in the best condition that it can possibly be. All right, there we go. All right, we conquered the technology today. All right, so uh, now we'll go ahead and ask for general public comments. And I do have one, and then uh, I think Brita or Britta was your name. You had a question from the uh, presentation, but that now you could ask a question. Um, after our first public comment here, uh, Lou Kotnick from uh, Brevard Indian River Lagoon Coalition. Okay, now I'm on, oh, and look at that. Um, Logan, you've got the, you've got the image up. Um, so Lou Kotnick with the Brevard Indian River Lagoon Coalition. Um, and um, uh, I just wanted to say how refreshing and, and how touching it is to be here today, having all gone through the COVID. And it kind of, I was reminded of, of just how much we're, we lost and we're regaining as I drove by uh, the health department and saw the line of, of cars. Um, again, I think the video, Stephanie, that you did just is a testament uh, to the way we feel, I feel, and so many of us do about the lagoon and about what you've done and what you've done during this year long uh, winter. Um, I'm here today really to talk about uh, our straight talk. <laughs> it's been a year since we've had a straight talk, and this one is going to be uh, on Zoom. It will focus on uh, Palm Bay and uh, consistent with the excellent uh, presentation that Becky made about transparency, it will focus on what's been done, those projects complete, 
um, and and what we can go, what we can do further, and to educate the community. And that's really what these straight talks and what the what the uh, uh, Brevard Indian R River Lagoon is about. So, um, uh, or rather, the Brevard Indian R River Lagoon Coalition is about so much. Come and get your questions, or attend and get your questions asked. Uh, and answered um, by Commissioner Zonka, uh, by City Manager, Palm Bay City Manager, uh, Suzanne Sherman, uh, by Virginia Barker, um, and by St. John's. Sometimes we don't pay enough attention to the importance of St. John's uh, River uh, Water Management District in the uh, impact and the improvement of the lagoon. So Dr. Jennifer Mitchell will be there uh, to speak to that. So what I wanted to what I wanted to emphasize um, is that you can you you on the video you who watch the video uh, can register by going to uh, the Brevard Indian River Lagoon uh, website helpthelagoon.org. That's help thelagoon.org. Let me just remind that one more time, helpthelagoon.org. And there's a link there that will take you directly to the Zoom registration. Um, you can also find it on uh, our, our uh, uh, Facebook and uh, uh, the Sorrel Facebook as well. Um, so the question or the ask that I have to really to complete this is to ask each of you on the COC and others in the county and those that are watching, please go ahead and share that link with everybody. We've got about 150 people registered at this point. We'd like to see it 300. So please share it. Thanks an awful lot and thanks for all you do. All right, uh, Lou, thank you so much. Um, I've been to a few of those events for those that have them there. They are straight talk. It is, it's good stuff. Um, it's really good to hear everybody uh, get their questions out um, and answers. Okay, um, any other public comments? Oh, okay. Well, David, you're not a public, you're part of the committee, but if you'd like to uh, have a conversation, if you'd like to say something now, go right ahead. Oh, well, I figured, I figured committee comments were coming up next. They, they were. You got in line first, so uh, go ahead. <laughs> okay, lucky me. Um, I wanted to take a minute and commend Dr. Windsor um, for his leadership over the last year, uh, watching, observing from home, watching these meetings get set up, and, you know, we're just... I'm just observing like the five or 10 minutes before the meeting. I can only imagine all the effort that went in, you know, to the, to the days and weeks prior to each meeting. And it reminds me a lot of 2016 when we were flying this plane as we were building it, as they say. And um, I just think what Dr. Windsor did uh, the entire last year is just highly, highly commendable. And um, I think he, he, deserves, he deserves to be recognized. Okay, thank you, David. I, I agree. Um, I'm a big, big Dr. Windsor fan, for those that don't know. Um, all right, so uh, for the uh, final comments by chair or any committee members, any, any members have uh, comments? All right. Um, it, oh, Terry, Terry's got a comment. It wouldn't be a meeting if we didn't hear from Terry. Go ahead, Terry. You're muted, Terry. Yep, sorry. Okay. Um, <clears throat> maybe get a sense from the committee of, um, you know, where your barometer is these days. We heard Dr. Jacoby's presentation, you know, and it was, you know, it was forward leaning. It was, you know, had a tinge of optimism in it. Um, and, and, and the survey gave us, you know, some positive feedback, but but I personally am concerned about things. And a couple of things that didn't come up, for instance, in, in Dr. Jacoby's presentation, one of, the, one of the concerning aspects is in the, um, in the report card tracking the water clarity um, over the lagoon over the last many years, you know, we're seeing the water clarity improving since the 2011 um, die off of the seagrass, but we're not seeing the seagrass come back. 
And now we're seeing, you know, uh, a doubling of uh, the manatee uh, mortality rate. And, and one of the expectations is these creatures are just starving to death because there's not enough natural forage for them. Um, and, and the other element is, is stormwater. We're doing a lot with the stormwater projects. We just heard some of them um, presented today. But, you know, I, I ride around the county and, and, and adjacent counties, and I'm just overwhelmed by the surface area that we are paving over. Uh, just everywhere I go, I see, you know, palmetto scrubs being being, you know, plowed down and, and uh, 100, 200, I don't know, 500 uh, housing units going in. Uh, we just saw a thing, this new pineapple uh, development in, in O'Galley on, uh, on Pineapple Ave took what was a uh, pervious uh, surface parking lot and, you know, now it's, it's hard concrete and it's uh, storm, you know, it's, it's, the, it's roofs and everything. So, so those are the two, I mean, those are, those are a couple of things that concern me. And I just wonder, am I just out here, you know, worrying or do, do any of you share, you know, kind of similar concerns and maybe what we could put together for next time is, so what, what besides just monitoring the plan should we think about trying to do? Thank you, Terry. Um, very, very good, good questions. Good, good points, comments. Um, anybody on the committee? Yeah, uh, Vinny, I, I guess I would pretty much echo what uh, Terry was saying. And in fact, during the uh, survey, when we were talking about the, that was done, one of the parts of that cycle said, well, the more tourists we get, the more money we get for Sorrel. But you know, the counterpart of that is the more tourists we get, the more pollution we get too. I mean, there's just a fact of life. So I think, you know, looking at things a little more holistically, I think that's where Terry's going, is uh, probably something appropriate. I mean, I know we have our bounds, what we can do, and there's a lot of things we can't control, uh, you know, and that's what our charter has to look at that. But I, I think it warrants, you know, at least a look. And uh, it goes back in part to uh, public lands. You know, we have this, we voted on this wonderful bill to, save uh, a lot of lands and uh, the legislature has failed to meet the intent of those purchases. You know, I think we're at 80 million maybe in this coming session. And uh, I know those numbers bounce around, but it should be 300 million. So in order to counter some of these developments, like uh, Terry was saying, you know, we're going to need more native or natural lands. So, uh, you know, that's something that we should be considering too. Thank you, Charlie. Uh, Dennis. Yeah, um, one of the things that I was kind of uh, took me aback uh, um, in the presentation today was how little of the money that we've allocated, which is basically all of it that we perceive, um, is actually has actually been spent. I think, if I remember correctly, it was a number like twenty nine thousand twenty nine million dollars at this point for Judy. Sure. Crystal, maybe uh, it was a fairly small number in relationship to where we're going, which tells me that the, the preparation and the permitting and everything else is taking a long time to get there. So going back to uh, what Terry just talked about, that you know we're not seeing quick changes, we're not seeing it happen, even though we all are talking about it a lot and have allocated the money for it, it doesn't appear we've already spent that money yet. Am I missing that? Uh, you're, you're correct. While we have um, started the ball rolling on about 250 million in projects, uh, we have only paid invoices about 10% of that amount. So we have a lot of projects coming, and Chris was passing me numbers, um, over 23 million yeah. um, spent. But yes, there, there is a, a lag time between um, getting projects started and getting them constructed and completed and functioning, uh, reducing nutrient loads to the lagoon. And I, I think that's something that we need to be sure that we put out into our any presentations we make that 
Um, uh, we're going to see an awful lot of projects that we've approved and are moving forward with permitting and everything else that haven't actually happened. When that full $250 million starts actually being under construction, we're going to see this county filled with construction projects for what we're doing. And uh, I've missed that for probably six or eight months until I start one of the one of the spreadsheets started looking like, hey, we're actually getting ready to construct. And I think that's where it's going to start happening. Um, but, uh, uh, you know, I think we're on the right track. As far as the, uh, I've got to say something about the uh, 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 bulldozing the, um, uh, the uh, uh, Palmetto uh, that Terry mentioned. Um, the, the, uh, I'm, I'm doing some consulting work for a developer right this minute. And I just got turned down to add an extra retention pond to slow water from a 22 lot subdivision uh, to slow it down from going into the Indian River. The city of Melbourne turned it down. Uh, now we think that that's gonna change, uh, but it's it, it's on so many different levels. Um, the legislation that you have to jump through as a developer to uh, create a subdivision is pretty significant. Um, it's a, uh, you know, if, if it's not, if it's something we're concerned about, if the retention ponds are not doing their job, modern retention ponds are not doing their job, then we need to change the legislation uh, to do that. Recognize that will change prices in Brevard County on housing also. So it's just, or we just need to buy the land um, and uh, deal with it that way. That's the comments. Okay, uh, David, uh, uh, Dennis, thank you so much. Um, uh, David. Thanks, Benny. I was just gonna add uh, two things to Terry's point. I, I want to agree that it looks like any undeveloped lands in Brevard County are fast becoming, um, or, or maybe fast should become part of the EEL program anything that doesn't have a building on it is almost an environmentally endangered land these days. Um, but um, I would be interested in, I don't know if it would be a presentation or just learning more um, about the Brevard County's maybe legacy planning um, for preserving lands, um, EEL lands or, or otherwise, uh, maybe see a, a future uh, or learn uh, a presentation about um, uh, future land use. I know in my development days uh, from decades ago, uh, you know, much of the shoreline along the lagoon is future zone for high density housing, um, places that are, are rural right now or a five acre minimum rural. Um, uh, if you look at the future land uh, use mapping, it's high density. And um, yeah, it's kind of scary to think uh, that we're going to allow high density without maybe um, a defined legacy plan in place for the county. Anyways, I, I would just like to learn more about that. If there's something like that available, I don't know if we could have a presenter or or there's something um, codified to that effect. I don't know, but I would be interested in learning more, and, and I agree with Terry's sentiment. Okay. Uh, thank you, David. I, I Virginia is in comp planning or zoning and planning? Planning and development folks about what they might or might not be able to do, but I, I'm not aware of um, uh, any anything that's readily shareable at this time. Um, and for the county's environmentally endangered lands program, that the funding for that program is set to sunset in 2024. Um, and so right now they are using the existing uh, revenue stream to manage the lands that have been purchased in the past. And um, so without a new funding stream, I am not aware of any future purchases for more environmentally endangered lands. Go ahead, Courtney. 
So uh, I'm, I would just say that I'm, I would be a little concerned with bringing growth management as a whole in terms of, you know, what is the county doing into this committee, largely because what we're here to do is guide the, the, the spending of the tax dollars and the projects that go along with that. You know, getting involved in growth management, you can even hear the different perspectives of everyone that spoke so far on that subject. So you're basically bringing in considerable politics into this committee. Um, you know, there are other boards that the county commission establishes for that conversation, like the planning and zoning commission, the EELS commission, you know, the EELS board and so on. So I, I think if we talked about a, a specific aspect to development, like if we talked about, you know, what would low impact development help in the, um, you know, that, that type of, um, like I know the Marine Resources Council is working on that, you know, how would that, how would that help us minimize the amount that we spend on stormwater projects? That may be a way to talk about it, but to talk about what is the county doing globally for growth management, we're getting into a whole subject matter that may be incredibly difficult, um, you know, discussion to have that's kind of really outside of our wheelhouse. So just having, you know, a lot, 20 plus years of experience of dealing with growth management issues, I'm just, you know, we're, we're inviting uh, a pretty hefty topic into the chambers, into our chambers that may come back badly on us later, particularly when we're trying to get our, you know, within the realm of what we're, we're supposed to be doing and then the, what we're chartered to do. So that's just my concern. Yeah, I just want a quick right, comment. Uh, uh, Court, Courtney, okay. Courtney, I agree with you. Uh, I'm, and I'm very sensitive to the um, um, the boundaries of our scope. <clears throat> and I wasn't suggesting that. Well, I guess what I'm trying to suggest is uh, more of an educational um, perspective, um, whether it's whether we learn something that we can do something about through the committee is is almost secondary to informing this group um, as to, you know, what are, what are the different things that are going on and, and, and just, you know, wait, raising awareness. Again, to me, it comes back to if we don't do something about the upstream problems, we're going to be removing muck for the next, you know, uh, decades. Uh, anyhow, thank you. And I think, you know, if we, if we brought like, um, you know, how a presentation that was just very general, you know, how do you growth management strategies affect the environment and the water quality? Maybe something of that nature that would inform the community and educate the community and maybe assist us in our own communities. Um, but I don't think it, it would have to be an educational presentation, you know, I think to stay out of, um, you know, walking into a political problem okay all right uh dennis it's just a just a quick follow-up um just so you know uh you know you all know i'm a commercial real estate broker um i'm also an environmentalist uh if i could find high and dry 40 acre parcels of land in brevard county without gopher tortoises scrub jays bald eagles wetlands, um, the list goes on and on and on. Um, I could sell them instantly tomorrow and have 10 people standing in line for it. They don't exist. Uh, what you're gonna see is small infill projects. Uh, the major developers right this minute, or excuse me, the major builders right this minute, they're looking at small Palm Bay lots uh, and buying them individually one at a time because they can't find property anymore in this community, in all of Brevard County. Uh, that's close to services, water, sewer, et cetera. Uh, the cost of development of the land that's left is very, very, very expensive. It makes it not productive. Uh, case in point, uh, there's a golf course that was there forever up on US-1 in the Titusville area. That's gone because bulldozing a golf course was cheaper than finding raw land. 
uh, project I'm involved in down off of uh, Mitten Road, same thing. They bulldoze the golf course uh, because the land is not available. It's not already environmentally protected. So uh, I understand Terry's position very well. Uh, and I, I think you're going to find the development of Brevard County is going to slow down um, or it's going to be a whole lot of discussion about what can be done to alleviate the issues that are that the development does cause so that some of the other lands can be uh, utilized for development purposes. But I think you're going to see a redevelopment taking place, taking old houses and uh, uh, what we call in the industry gentrification uh, and taking those old houses and redeveloping the land by taking the building off and putting a new house on. Uh, it's already happening in some of the beachside communities. So there is a little bit of hope in the future from a develop from a uh, environmental standpoint that the developers are just not going to be able to do anything in the future. Okay, thank you. Uh, Stephanie. I just wanted to echo the concerns that Courtney had, and I agree with those that it really isn't our purview to get into growth management. And so I think we need to be very cautious about that. Okay. All right. Um, any other comments or questions? All right. Well, before, before I close the meeting, I, I, I did want to, uh, there was something that I wanted to uh, talk about, and it was kind of what Terry and Dennis and Courtney and Stephanie and everyone had talked about. Um, and I don't know for those that were on the committee when we were building the plane as we were flying it, it was exciting, it was scary. And I think, um, I think sometimes uh, you know, we can get uh, used to and get comfort in where we are. And I think, I think where we are is a good place, but I think we should always strive to, to, you know, to add parts to this plane that we're still flying and make parts better. You know, there's a coffee maker that might need to be fixed in the back. So um, I, I would, I, I think, uh, I'd like to, you know, challenge everybody to keep thinking about different ways that we can, um, in our own lanes and our own lives, um, bring new things in to the committee to discuss. Um, and then we can see if they're within our purview, and if they're not, then, then they're not. Um, but I think, I think that's a good idea. Um, so, uh, again, um, thank you, everybody. It was a good first meeting. I hope, <laughs> I hope it was a good one. Um, all right, everybody, and uh, we'll go down to the adjournment. Uh, have a good month. And we'll see everybody next month. Take care. Be safe. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Be safe, everyone. Go Gators! The opinions expressed by any member of the public during any period of public comment do not necessarily reflect the views or opinions of the Board of County Commissioners of Brevard County, Florida, Space Coast Government Television, or the program sponsor and are solely those of the presenter. The Board of County Commissioners of Brevard County, Florida, Space Coast Government Television, and the program sponsor hereby expressly disclaim any and all responsibility or liability for any defamatory or slanderous statements expressed by any member of the public during any such period.